Yo, welcome ladies and gentlemen to yet another iceberg video by yours truly. While I've been hard at work on a rather extensive Newgrounds iceberg series, I thought it might be fun to release a, a less gigantic iceberg series in the meantime, to sort of tide you all over until then. And so today we'll be coming over the disturbing Wikipedia articles iceberg by Arya Crown, which just as it sounds is an iceberg covering various disturbing, strange, and generally messed up articles that can be found in the site. We've of course, quite a few bonus entries along the way. With that being said, this iceberg really is something totally different with each entry, so you never quite know what you're going to get. Some of it can be quite curious, and some of it is quite tragic, while others are truly demented and extremely dark. Bearing that all in mind, please sit back, relax, and let's dive into the disturbing Wikipedia articles iceberg together, shall we? So if you're like me, you probably care a great deal about your online security, and thus it's not exactly a comforting feeling to be able to look up your name or email address and be able to easily find info about yourself. Info that's then collected by data brokers and sold to scammers, spammers, and really anyone who may want to target you. Your full name, email, home address, health records, your relatives, it's all out there. And that's why Aura, the sponsor of today's video, is something that I personally use. Aura shows me which data brokers are selling my information and automatically submits opt-out requests for me. This helps me clean up my information and keep my info out of the hands of hackers and the like, getting access to my social media accounts, bank accounts, or other sensitive information. However, Aura actually does so much more than that. Aura also features a VPN to keep my location hidden, a password manager, which is helpful since I tend to change them often, an antivirus, and even identity theft insurance, all within one simple to use app, always working in the background for one affordable price. Some of you may already have a VPN, but Aura offers so much more than just a VPN for a lower price of that. I can personally attest that as an online content creator, I value my privacy. And if you value yours too, then I cannot recommend Aura enough. It gets the Night Owl seal of approval. And if you click the link in the description, aura.com slash night owl, you can start a free two week trial to test it out for yourself right now. Thank you so very much to Aura for sponsoring this video. And now on with the show. The Hitler Game. Okay, so we're starting out with an entry that's actually less of a specific article and more so a meta game of sorts that one can play on wikipedia.com. According to the Urban Dictionary, the Hitler Wikipedia game can be described as, quote, a game with the object of reaching Hitler's Wikipedia page by clicking on random article, then clicking links in that article to get to other articles, until eventually you can find a link to Adolf Hitler's page. There are rules against using the find on this page option in your browser, and there is sometimes a time limit on how long you can spend on each page. Your score is determined by your number of clicks before clicking on Hitler's page. If you reach Hitler's page by clicking on random article, you've been the game forever and are probably Jesus." Unquote. On that note, you can actually play a very of this game called the Jesus game, where you, well, do the same thing, but with Jesus. 
And I suppose you could probably play any variation of this game with just about any popular figure in history. Chick culling. Chick culling, as the Wikipedia article notes, quote, is the process of separating and killing unwanted male and unhealthy female chicks for which the intensive animal farming industry has no use. It occurs in all industrialized egg production, whether free range, organic, or battery cage. However, some certified pasture raised egg farms are taking steps to eliminate the practice entirely. Worldwide, around 7 billion male chicks are culled each year in the egg industry. This is done because male chicks do not lay eggs, and only those in breeding programs are required to fertilize eggs. They are considered redundant to the egg-laying industry, and are usually killed shortly after being sexed which occurs just days after they are conceived or after they hatch. Some methods of culling that do not involve anesthetics include cervical dislocation, asphyxiation by carbon dioxide, and maceration using a high-speed grinder. Maceration is the primary method in the United States. Maceration is often the preferred method over carbon dioxide asphyxiation in Western countries as it is often considered as more humane due to the death securing immediately or within a second." Unquote. And there are several videos online, as well as pictures of this process being done to baby chicks, but I'll uh, spare you from seeing the gritty details. It's one of those hard truth realities when it comes to food production of this kind, but is, nevertheless, disturbing to see and face. John Zegris. John Zegris, according to the Wikipedia article, is, quote, the reported name of a man detained in 1960 in Japan for alleged document fabrication. He was dubbed as the mystery man by Japanese news at the time and became a prototype for some urban legends." Unquote. And as noted, there is a real incident and story connected with this, as well as uh, more urban legends connected with it. So, starting with the actual story of the incident, quote, In October of 1959, a man recorded as John Allen Kuchur Zegris, 36, entered Japan with his Korean wife. There, months after, he was arrested by the Tokyo Metropolitan Police, suspected of identity fraud. He tried to cash a 200 thousand yen check and a $140 around 50,400 yen at the time traveler's check at the Japanese office of Chase Manhattan Bank and 100,000 yen at the Japanese office of Bank of Korea. According to the records, Zegris said he was born in the US, moved to the UK through Czechoslovakia and Germany and attended high school there. During World War II, he was a pilot in the Royal Air Force and was once captured by the Germans. After the war, he lived in Latin America. Later, he became a spy for the Americans in South Korea, served as a pilot in Thailand and Vietnam, and after that, he was assigned by the United Arab Republic. He arrived in Japan for a secret mission, which included recruiting Japanese military volunteers for the United Arab Republic. Eventually, after contacting the mentioned countries, it was ruled that the information was not based on facts, and the seals in his pseudo-passport were proven to be fabricated. On the 10th of August 1960, Tokyo District Court reviewed the case and sentenced Zegris to one year in prison. After the announcement, he tried to commit by cutting his veins with a piece of glass secretly brought to him to the court. After his release, Zegris was deported from Japan to Hong Kong, from where he was recorded to an entire region. His wife was deported to South Korea." Unquote. And that's the true story of this incident. And while the man's fake story is indeed kind of interesting, Interesting, it ultimately just proved to be someone committing identity fraud. However, this would somehow, through word of mouth and reports by the news, be turned into an urban legend about a man from another dimension, and that he had a passport from a fictional country, and how he apparently disappeared a day after being questioned with no one knowing what happened to him. This is, of course, all just an urban legend and lies at this point, but it is nevertheless the story that lived on from this incident and would come to be shared all throughout the internet, with the story evolving from a man from another dimension to a time traveler to a possible alien, etc, etc. 
Poe Toaster. Poe Toaster is the nickname given to an unidentified person who, according to the Wikipedia article, is noted as, quote, for several decades, paid an annual tribute to the American author Edgar Allan Poe by visiting the cenotaph marking his original grave in Baltimore, Maryland, in the early hours of January 19th, Poe's birthday. The shadowy figure, dressed in black with a wide-brimmed hat and white scarf, would pour himself a glass of cognac and raise a toast to Poe's memory, then vanish into the night, leaving three roses in a distinctive arrangement and the unfinished bottle of liquor. Onlookers gathered annually in hopes of glimpsing the elusive toaster, who did not seek publicity and was rarely seen or photographed. According to eyewitness reports and notes accompanying offerings in later years, the original toaster made the annual visitation from sometime in the 1930s, though no report appeared on print until until 1950s, until his death in 1998, after which the tradition was passed on to a quote-unquote son. Controversial statements were then made in some of the notes left by the post-1998 toaster, the supposed son. And in 2010, there was no visit by the toaster, with absences between 2011 and 2012 signaling an end to the 75-year tradition. However, in 2016, the Maryland Historical Society selected a new toaster to revive the tradition, unquote. And so it has gone on to be a tradition ever since. And here is one of the only supposed photographs of the original Poe Toaster. There was never any concerted effort to find out the identity of the Poe Toaster, and while there have been many claims from people being the original over the years, nothing has ever been known for sure, and thus it remains a mystery. Though I personally find it funny that this is probably just some really big Edgar Allan Poe fan that was sort of doing a bit of a LARP, you know, going out to a cemetery, drinking cognac, dressed in black, doing goth shit, you know? Until finally someone happened to notice him and yeah. Yeah, a true legend to be sure. Euthanasia Coaster. This is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. It's a hypothetical roller coaster design that would, uh, fucking end your life. Quote, the Euthanasia Coaster is the name given to a hypothetical steel roller coaster designed with the sole purpose of killing its passengers. The concept was conceived in 2010 and made into a scale model by Lithuanian artist Julianus Urbonus, a PhD candidate at the Royal College of Art in London. Urbonus, who has experience as an amusement park employee, stated that the goal of the concept roller coaster was to take the lives with elegance and euphoria. The concept design of the layout begins with a steep angled lift that takes riders up 500 meters or 1,600 feet to the top, a climb which would take a few minutes to complete, allowing the user to contemplate their life. For comparison, the tallest roller coaster in the world is King Dakar at 193 meters or 456 feet. From there, the user may exit the coaster. If they do not, they would have some time to say their last words and press a button to continue to a 500 meter or again 1,600 feet drop, which would take the train to 360 kilometers per hour, close to its terminal velocity, before flattening out and speeding into to the first of its seven slightly clothoid inversions. Each inversion would be of a smaller diameter than the last to maintain the lethal 10 Gs of force on the passengers as the train loses speed. After a sharp right-hand turn, the train would enter a straight track that goes back to the station, where the dead can be unloaded and new passengers can board." Unquote. Quite the uh, morbid description, I must say. And in case you're curious about how exactly this would uh, make you exit the game of life, well, it would happen through prolonged cerebral hypoxia or insufficient supply of oxygen to your brain. The ride's seven inversions would inflict 10 Gs of force on its passengers for 60 seconds, causing G-force related symptoms, starting with gray out through tunnel vision to blackout, G-lock or G-force induced loss of consciousness and eventually death. It really is a roller coaster so intense that it kills you. No tricks about it. And in case you're wondering, they would have the roller coaster go twice around just in case you uh somehow managed to live through all of that. Mind you, this coaster was never actually built and was all purely hypothetical design at work. But it is still nonetheless quite the haunting idea to take a ride on a roller coaster and come back dead by its end. 
end. It's also kind of cool. Black Eyes Children. This entry refers to the urban legend originating from America of children or some sort of creature or paranormal entity of some kind that looks like a child ages 6 to 16 with pale skin and black eyes who have reportedly been seen hitchhiking or begging or are encountered on doorsteps of residential homes. Quote, while tabloid coverage of the creatures has claimed the tales of black-eyed children have existed since the 1980s, most sources indicate that the legend originated from the 1996 postings written by Texas reporter Brian Bethel on a ghost-related mailing list relating to alleged encounters with black-eyed kids. Bethel describes encountering two such children in Abilene, Texas of 1996 and claims that a second person had a similar unrelated encounter in Portland, Oregon. Bethel's stories have become regarded as classic examples of creepypasta and gained such popularity that she published an FAQ just to keep up with the demand for more info about the new urban legend. In 2012, Brian Bethel told his story on reality TV series Monsters and Mysteries in America. He wrote a follow-up article for the Abilene Reporter News describing his experience and maintaining his belief that it was all legitimate, unquote. And yeah, these black-eyed kids became almost like popular creepypasta characters or entities that would show up often in those true scary story videos and Reddit posts that were almost always just creepypastas under the guise of being at least told within the realm of reality, rather than, you know, a scary video game possessing your TV or the tragic backstory of Harold the Teenage Killer, you know, sort of average creepypasta stuff. It actually makes me wonder if there's a true scary story iceberg out there somewhere, similar to the creepypasta ones. Hmm, cute aggression. Have you ever looked at something so cute that you kind of just want to squeeze it? Well, that is in essence what this is. Quote, cute aggression or playful aggression is superficially aggressive of behavior caused by seeing something cute, such as a young human or animal. People experiencing cute aggression may grit their teeth, clench their fists, or feel the urge to bite, pinch, or squeeze something they perceive as cute." Unquote. Another example of this, as noted in the article, is when people say to their babies, I just want to eat you up, or pinch your cheeks, that sort of thing. Quote, Playful aggression is a type of dimorphous display in which a positive experience elicits expressions usually associated with negative emotions. This behavior occurs more commonly in individuals who experience dimorphous emotions across a range of situations and may help to regulate emotions by balancing an overwhelming positive emotion with a negative response. Intense positive feelings often produce hybrid categorically positive and typical negative expressions. This is commonly witnessed in situations in which a person is so overwhelmed by happiness that they begin to tear up or even cry. Such regulation of emotion has been coined dimorphous expression." Unquote. But yeah, pretty interesting stuff. Hallucinogen Persisting Perception Disorder. This entry refers to, as noted by the article itself, quote, a non-psychotic disorder in which a person experiences apparent lasting or persistent visual hallucinations or perpetual distortions after a previous use of drugs, including but not limited to psychedelics, disassociatives, intactogens, THC, and SSRIs. The hallucinations and perpetual changes consist of, but are not limited to, visual snow, trails, and afterimage light fractals on flat surfaces, intensified colors, altered motion perception, pareidolia, micropsia, and macropsia." Unquote. Those last three, by the way, in order to expand upon it a bit more, are pareidolia, or basically the tendency for us to perceive an image onto something that's not there, kind of like looking at an electric outlet and seeing two little eyes and a mouth, or looking at a car and seeing the lights as eyes, etc. And then micropsia and macropsia are the mind perceiving objects as smaller or larger than they are respectively. The effects of HPPD can actually happen to people who have never actually taken drugs though as well. And some of you might be familiar with the term floaters or visual snow, 
as an example. Blue Whale Challenge. So this one is rather dark and is a bit of a rabbit hole in of itself. To start, quote, the Blue Whale Challenge is a social network phenomenon dating from 2016 that is claimed to exist in several countries. It is a game reportedly consisting of a series of tasks assigned to players by administrators over a 50-day period. Initially innocuous before introducing elements of self-harm and the final challenge requiring the player to fly Blue Whale first attracted news coverage in May of 2016 in an article in the Russian newspaper Novaya Gazeta that linked many unrelated child to membership of group F57 on the Russian-based VK social network. A wave of moral panic swept Russia. However, the piece was later criticized for attempting to make a casual link where none existed, and none of the Sviasus were found to be a result of the group's activities. Claims of Sviasus connected to the game have been reported worldwide, but none have been confirmed." Unquote. That's the basics. And in case you're wondering, no one really knows the reason why it's called the Blue Whale Challenger game, with one of the more popular theories being that it could be in reference to beaching where whales become stranded on beaches and die, but seems a bit of a stretch. The game was supposedly played via different social media platforms, with the admin of the game giving the player instructions over the next 50 days, with it at first being simple stuff like wake up at this time or watch a horror movie, and eventually going into full-on fucked up shit as it went along. Long. This whole thing caused quite the hysteria as noted before. Quote, While many experts suggest Blue Whale was originally a sensationalized hoax, they believe that it is likely that the phenomenon had led to instances of imitative self-harming and copycat groups, leaving vulnerable children at risk of cyberbullying and online shaming. Unquote. In other words, while it may have started as a scary urban legend that people panicked over without any real evidence of it actually existing, it eventually did foster real events inspired by the story. Sadly, Regardless of there being no evidence of these things, several Sviasus from everywhere from the United States to Spain to Italy to Brazil all over would be said to have been linked to the game. But again, there was never any real evidence of this being the case. The Blue Whale Challenge seemed to have become a bit of a boogeyman for people, and perhaps a bit of a lampshade to the actual sad, terrible reality that just happened before them, which was young people committing Sviasus. Nevertheless, there have been some arrests connected to this game, again due to nasty disgusting people getting inspired by the crazy story to then actually use it to try and harm or groom children. Quote, in 2016, Philip Budikin, a 21-year-old former psychology student who was expelled from his university, claimed that he invented the game in 2013. According to Budikin, his purpose is to clean society of biological wastes, as he intended to clean society from individuals who were deemed as having no value and considered as burdens. Although originally claiming innocence and stating he was just having fun, Budikin was arrested and held in Cresty Prison. St. Petersburg, and in May 2016 pled guilty to inciting at least 16 teenage girls to commit Hryasus. He was later convicted on two counts of inciting Hryasus of a minor. Commentators such as Benjamin Radford had pointed out that sensationalized stories and world news regarding the involvement of Budokin have all linked back to just two Russian sources, with tabloid news outlets replicating the same information without elaboration." Unquote. It's clear Budokin isn't actually the creator of this game since for all intents and purposes it's just a big fucking hoax. But he is an edgy piece of shit and was sentenced to three years and four months in prison all the same. In another case of someone being arrested, quote, June 2017, postman Ilya Sidorov was arrested in Moscow, also accused of setting up a blue whale group who encouraged children to self-harm and ultimately die by Hryasus. He claimed to have persuaded 32 children to join this group and follow his commands, unquote. When trying to find out more info about this case, I found that he was ultimately 
found at least guilty of trying to coax a 14 year old girl to end her life. And after she failed to do so, attempting to extort money from her as punishment. To which his punishment was hard labor at a penal colony. For how long I couldn't seem to find any concrete info on. Finally, quote, in June 2018, 22 year old Russian financial analyst Nikita Niranov was arrested for allegedly masterminding the Blue Whale game. Niranov is suspected of grooming 10 underage girls in order to bring them to yeah, so it's two of whom, aged 14 and 17, are known to have survived. As a financial analyst, Niranov has been described as very smart, computer expert who held a large amount of contempt for teenagers, believing that they were wicked and deserved to die. Police reports claim that Niranov's involvement in the Blue Well game was his hobby, unquote. I had a very hard time finding any follow-up info on this one. If any of you are aware of the fate of Nikita, and if he was found guilty of any of this, please please let me know in the comments below. Something strange too is when researching into any of these cases, all the headlines address all three of these separate individuals as the true mastermind behind the Blue Whale game, all being erroneous for the sake of more catchy headlines, I suppose. But that's just old news media sites for ya. Can never really trust them. Simple as that. This man. Ah. Now, I have covered this one a bit in my a Creepypasta Iceberg a while back, but to quickly go over the info in the wiki article, quote, This man is a mysterious individual who is purportedly appeared in the dreams of numerous people around the world since 2006, yet his real world identity remains unknown. In 2008, Italian sociologist and marketer Andrea Nutella created a website called Ever Dream This Man that focused on this phenomenon. On. According to the website, the first individual to report dreaming this man was a patient of a psychiatrist in New York City in 2006, and four other patients of the same psychiatrist also recognized the same face. The website received over 9,000 accounts from people who claimed to have encountered this man in their dreams, sharing their stories and drawings. Various theories were proposed to explain this man's appearance, ranging from mundane to supernatural, but none were sustained by evidence or investigation. The website gained attention from the press and online users in October of 2009 and became a viral sensation. This man's notoriety spawned several internet memes that spoofed flyers of the website, references in films and TV shows like The X-Files and the manga series by Weekly Shonen Magazine. It eventually came out that this man was a hoax and was originally a guerrilla marketing campaign for Nutella's advertising agency. Nutella admitted that she had fabricated the whole story and that uh, he had based the original sketch of this man on a photo of his father when he was young. Nutella said that he was inspired by the concept of dream invasion, which he had encountered in some movies and books, and that he wanted to explore the power of the internet to create and spread urban legends and collective myths. Unquote. And yeah, that's pretty much well covers it. There are some creepy pastas and the like connected with this photo and the story, but ultimately they are just that stories. Still, it is a pretty cool concept. A person who no one has ever met appearing in multiple people's dreams. Their visage burned into their minds. 2019 Polar Bear Invasion Quote, In February 2019, the Russian archipelago of Novaya Zemla in the Arctic Ocean experienced a mass invasion of polar bears. Dozens of polar bears were seen trying to enter homes, civic buildings, and inhabited areas. The Arkhangelsk Oblast authorities declared a state of emergency on the 16th of February 2019. According to the local report agency, at least 52 bears entered the area near Belushia Guba, the main settlement of the island. Footage shows the polar bears looking for food in the rubbish at a local dump, unquote. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much the story. Bunch of polar bears started breaking into people's houses and stealing their garbage. Polybius. Now this is a famous one, and one that most of you probably know by now I'd bet, but nevertheless I shall quickly cover the basics for the few of you that don't know about this famous urban legend. Quote, Polybius is a fictitious 1981 arcade game from an urban legend. The legend describes the game as part of a government-run crowdsourced psychology experiment 
Based in Portland, Oregon, gameplay supposedly produced intense psychoactive and addictive effects in the player. These few publicly staged arcade machines were said to have been visited periodically by men in black for the purpose of data mining the machines and analyzing these effects. Supposedly, all of these polybius arcade machines then disappeared from the arcade market. This urban legend has persisted in video game journalism and through continued interest, and it has inspired video games with the same name." Unquote. That's the basics, and obviously from there, the legend became so popular that oftentimes at nearly any show, film, or cartoon that has a random arcade scene, there is sure to be a fake Polybius machine somewhere in the background. He's an interesting concept, a game designed by the government to test its players through gameplay that is said to be hypnotic and addictive. But yeah, ultimately, it's just a very popular urban legend. Nothing more. Deleted articles with freaky titles. As the entry suggests, this is about Wikipedia articles that have since been deleted that have rather ominous titles, making one wonder what exactly could be found within them. There are quite a few funny ones here as well, with the whole Wikipedia page being dedicated to documenting them. A few standouts I found by just quickly browsing through the page included Adolf Rizzler, Ass Full of Knife, Church of Sonic the Hedgehog, Dead Prostitutes and Popular Culture, Duck Raping, Gaping Anus, How Do I Stop My Son from Looking at Pikachu Porn, and uh, the list goes on. Green Children of Woolpit. Starting off tier two, we have a rather old tale. Quote, the legend of the Green Children of Woolpit concerns two children of unusual skin color who reportedly appeared in the village of Woolpit in Suffolk, England, sometime in the 12th century, perhaps during the reign of King Stephen. Unquote. The full story goes, quote, at harvest time, one day during the reign of King Stephen, according to William of of Newburgh, the villagers of Wolf Pit discovered two children, a brother and sister, beside one of the wolf pits that gave the village its name. Their skin was green, they spoke an unknown language, and their clothing was unfamiliar. Ralph of Cogshill reports that the children were taken to the home of Richard de Calne. Ralph and William agree that the pair refused all food for several days until they came across some raw, broad beans, which they consumed eagerly. The children gradually adapted to normal food and in time lost their green color. It was decided to baptize the children, but the boy, who appeared to be the younger of the two, was sickly and died before or soon after the baptism. After learning to speak English, the children, Ralph says, just the surviving girl, explained that they came from a land where the sun never shone and the light was like twilight. William says the girl called their home St. Martin's Land. Ralph adds that everything there was green, according to William. The children were unable to account for their arrival in Woolpit. They had been herding their father's cattle when they heard a loud noise and suddenly found themselves by the wolf pit where they were found. Ralph says that they had become lost when they found the cattle into a cave and, after being guided by the sound of the bells, eventually emerged into our land." Unquote. So, uh, what's up with this story? Did this really happen? Is it just a hoax? Well, there are apparently two solid theories as to the validity of this tale. One is that it just simply is a folk tale, a fairy tale of sorts, meant to be an interesting story and nothing much more to it, especially with it generally lining up with many tales of that sort. And the other train of thought is that it's a garbled account of a real event, that being of two children that fled their home and were green due to hyperchromic anemia, also known as chloros or green sickness, the result of a dietary deficiency, and that they could have been Flemish children, that being that they were inhabitants of the country of Flanders, thus the different language and strange clothes. However, there is no actual solid answer to this mystery. It still has inspired many different stories, novels, and theories about 
the strange tale. Retained Surgical Instruments This entry is specifically about when surgical instruments are accidentally left behind inside the patient's body in the course of surgery. These items could include anything from needles, knife blades, safety pins, scalpels, clamps, scissors, sponges, towels, etc. Which is, uh pretty serious obviously, and usually results in yet another surgery being needed to get the stuff out and could also potentially lead to said patient's death. According to the article, quote, the estimate of how often this type of mistake happens is unclear. According to the US Department of Health and Human Services, it is anywhere between 1 in 100 to 1 in 5,000. However, a study done in 2008 reported to the annuals of surgery that mistakes in tool and sponge counts happened in 12.5% of surgeries. Additionally, the patient safety monitor alert announced in 2003 that 1,500 tools were stitched into patients each year, unquote. Which is uh, an extremely terrifying statistic, uh, to be sure, and I'm unsure as to how this could possibly happen so often. So, yeah, live with that knowledge, I guess. List of incidents at Walt Disney World. This entry is all about, as per according to the article, quote, notable incidents that have taken place at Walt Disney World in Orlando, Florida. The term incident refers to major injuries, deaths, loss, or injury, or significant crimes related to the attractions themselves, or personal altercations and incidents between the theme park guests and employees." Unquote. Bearing that in mind, let's cover a few of the more uh, interesting slash dark ones listed since we can't cover them all here. Starting with the basic stuff, on the Avatar Flight of Passage ride, there have been several instances of visitors losing consciousness on the ride, which has since led to signs being put up warning about the ride. In a similar but far more drastic vein, on the dinosaur saw a ride at the Disney's Animal Kingdom part of the park, quote, On April 30th, 2005, a 30-year-old man from Mooresville, Indiana, lost consciousness shortly after exiting the ride and died from a heart attack moments later. An investigation showed the ride was operating correctly and was not the cause of the man's death. He had an artificial pacemaker, unquote. There was quite a few incidents like that with people with heart conditions. Whether they knew about it or not, getting on rides only to pass out or having a stroke during or after the ride, leading to their eventual deaths. With another example being, quote, On May 16, 1995, a four-year-old girl from Galveston, Texas, with a known heart condition, passed out during a ride in the Body Wars attraction in the Wonders of Life Pavilion. The ride was immediately stopped and paramedics airlifted her to Orlando Regional Medical Center, where she was pronounced dead. An autopsy was inconclusive as to whether the ride had aggravated her condition, unquote. On a far more sinister note, quote, On January 29th, 2018, a 20-year-old man from Venezuela was accused and charged of lewd and lascivious behavior after he molested an 8-year-old boy on the ride. The boy and his mother were seated next to the man who put one of his arms around the boy's chest his hand on the boy's knee and touched the boy's groin during the ride. He was arrested shortly thereafter, although he claimed it was an accident." Unquote. Another crazy incident happened on, quote, September 12th, 1992. A 37-year-old man named Alan J. Ferris from Rochester, New York entered Epcot after the park closed its gates for the night and brandished a shotgun at three security guards, demanding to see his ex-girlfriend, who worked at the park. He fired four blasts at the guards and took two guards hostage in a restroom near the journey into the Imagination Pavilion. As Orange County Sheriff's deputies surrounded the area, the man released his hostages and emerged from the restroom, the shotgun held to his chest. After exchanging words with deputies, he put the gun to his head and fired. He was pronounced dead on arrival at the Orlando Regional Medical Center. Investigators attributed his actions to a recent breakup of his longtime girlfriend." Unquote. There was another incident of a 38-year-old employee named Javier Cruz who had been playing the character of Pluto at the time 
being run over by the Beauty and the Beast float in the Share a Dream Come True Parade on February 11th, 2004, which Disney noted almost no one noticed during the parade, which sounds like quite the sad fate. And yeah, it could go on, but most are cases of people accidentally falling off rides, having heart attacks, or being groped by someone. Overall, pretty bad stuff. Devil's Footprints Quote, the Devil's Footprints was a phenomenon that occurred during February 1855, around the X estuary in East and South Devon, England. After a heavy snowfall, trails of hoof-like marks appeared overnight in the snow, covering a total distance of some 40 to 100 miles, 60 to 160 kilometers. The footprints were so called because some persons suggested that they were the tracks of Satan and made comparisons to a cloven hoof. Many theories have been made to explain the incident, and some aspects of its veracity have also been questioned." Unquote. There was apparently several reported cases of this happening, although the evidence for such cases, as you might imagine, are fairly dubious. Still, many suggest that the hoof marks are simply the footprints of donkeys and ponies, or possibly hopping mice, as noted. Quote, Mike Dash suggested that at least some of the prints, including some that were found on rooftops, could be made by hopping rodents such as wood mice. Print left behind after a mouse leaps resembles that of a cloven hoofed animal due to the motions of its limbs when it jumps." Unquote. So yeah, it could be anything from hopping mice to uh, donkeys to literally the devil. So take your pick. Out of place artifacts. Quote, an out of place artifact is an artifact of historical, archeological, or paleontological interest to someone that is claimed to have been found in an unusual context, which someone, usually the finder or owner, claims to challenge conventional historical chronology by its presence in that context. Some people might think that those artifacts are too advanced for the technology known to have existed at the time, or that human presence existed at a time before humans are known to have existed. Other people might hypothesize about a contact between different cultures that is hard to account for with conventional historical understanding. This description of archaeological objects is used in fringe science such as cryptozoology as well as by proponents of ancient astronaut theories, young earth creationists, and paranormal enthusiasts. You can describe a wide variety of items from anomalies studied by mainstream science to pseudo-archaeology to objects that have been shown to be hoaxes or to have conventional explanations." Unquote. So, bearing that in mind, what are some of these strange out-of-place artifacts. Well, to start, we have unusual artifacts, with one being the Antikythera mechanism, which noted in its own article to be, quote, an ancient Greek hand-powered ori, that is to say, model of the solar system, described as the oldest known example of an analog computer used to predict astronomical positions and eclipses decades in advance. This artifact was among wreckage retrieved from a shipwreck off the coast of the Greek island Antikythera in 1901. In 2008, a team of Cardiff University used computer x-ray tomography and high-resolution scanning to image inside fragments of the crust and case mechanism and read the faintest inscriptions that once covered the outer casings. This suggests it had 37 meshing bronze gears enabling it to follow the movements of the moon and the sun through the zodiac, to predict eclipses, and to model the irregular orbit of the moon, where the moon's velocity is higher in its perigee than in its opogee. This motion was studied in the 2nd century BC by astronomer Hipparchus of Rhodes, and he may have been consulted in the machine's construction." Unquote. It is out of place or unusual because its design and workmanship reflect a previously unknown but not implausible degree of sophistication and engineering for something made of its time. Then we have questionable interpretations of artifacts and why they are considered out of place, like that of the Baghdad Battery. Quote, the Baghdad Battery is a name given to a set of three artifacts which were found together, a ceramic pot, a tube of copper, and a rod of iron. It was discovered in present day Kajat Rabu, Iraq in 1936, close to the metropolis of 
Chisiphon, the capital of Perithian, 150 BC, and Sasanian empires, and is believed to date from either of these periods. Similar artifacts have been found at nearby sites. Its origin and purpose remain unclear. It was hypothesized by Wilhelm Koenig at the time director of the National Museum of Iraq that the object functioned as a galvanic cell, possibly used for electroplating or some kind of electrotherapy. But there is no electroplated object known from this period, and the claims are near universally rejected by archaeologists. An alternative explanation is that it functioned as a storage vessel for sacred scrolls." Unquote. So yeah, these are objects that are not confirmed to actually be out of place, but under the right interpretation have been seen as something out of place or strange for the time, but usually are rejected as kind of being a harebrained theory. Anyway, then you have stuff that was dated wrong entirely. Objects that turned out to just be natural objects thought to be something more, and of course, lots and lots of fake and hoax items, such as that of the Babylon Nokia. Quote, Babylon Nokia is a 2012 artwork by Carl Weingartner in the form of a clay tablet shaped like a mobile phone. His keys and screen showing cuneiform script. Weingartner created the work to represent the evolution of information transfer from the ancient world to the present. French scientists and pseudo-archaeology proponents subsequently misinterpreted the photo of the artwork as showing a 800-year-old archaeological find. That story was popularized in a video on the YouTube channel Paranormal Crucible and led to the object being reported by some press sources as a mystery, unquote. Which is pretty funny. Learned helplessness. So this article is about a rather interesting concept, that of learned helplessness. Quote, learned helplessness refers to an alleged correlation between the behavior exhibited by a subject and that subject's experience of enduring repeated adverse stimuli beyond their control. It was initially thought to be caused by the subject's acceptance of their powerlessness by way of their discontinuing attempts to escape or avoid the adverse stimulus, even when such alternatives are un ambiguously presented. Upon exhibiting such behavior, the subject was said to have acquired learned helplessness. In humans, learned helplessness is related to the concept of self-efficacy, the individual's belief in their innate ability to achieve goals. Learned helplessness theory is the view that clinical depression and related mental illnesses may result from a real or perceived absence of control or the outcome of a situation." Unquote. When looking into the early experiments regarding this concept, some truly disturbing stuff is showcased, involving the concept being applied to dogs. Quote, American psychologist Martin Seligman initiated research on learned helplessness in 1967 at the University of Pennsylvania as an extension of his interest in depression. This research was later expanded through experiments by Seligman and others. One of the first was the experiment by Seligman and Overmeyer. In part one of this study, three groups of dogs were placed in a harness. Group one dogs were simply put in the harness for a period of time and were later released. Groups two and three consisted of yoked pairs. Dogs in group two were given electric shocks at random times, which the dogs could end by pressing a lever. Each dog in group three was paired with a group two dog. Whenever a group two dog got a shock, his paired dog in group three got a shock at the same intensity and duration but its lever did not stop the shock. To a dog in group three, it seemed that the shock ended at random because it was their paired dog in group two that was causing it to stop. Thus, for group three dogs, the shock was inescapable. In part two of the experiment, the same three groups of dogs were tested in a shuttle box apparatus, a chamber containing two rectangular compartments divided by a barrier a few inches high. All the dogs could escape shocks on one side of the box by jumping over a low partition to the other side. The dogs in group one and two quickly learned this task and escaped the shock. Most of the group three dogs, which had previously learned that nothing they did had any effects on shocks, simply lay down passively and whined when they were shocked. In a second experiment later that year with new groups of dogs, Mare and Seligman ruled out the possibility that instead of learned helplessness, 
the group three dogs failed to advert to the second part of the test because they had learned some behavior that interfered with escape. To prevent such interfering behavior, group three dogs were immobilized with a paralyzing drug, Curare, and underwent a procedure similar to that in part one of the Silkman and Overmeyer experiment. When tested, as before in part two, these group three dogs inhibited helplessness as before. This result serves as an indicator for the ruling out of the interfering hypothesis. From these experiments, it was thought that there was to be only one cure for helplessness. In Seelgman's hypothesis, the dogs do not try to escape because they expect that nothing they do will stop the shock. To change this expectation, experimenters physically picked up the dogs and moved their legs, replicating the actions the dogs would need to take in order to escape from the electrified grid. This had been done at least twice before the dogs would start willfully jumping over the barrier on their own. In contrast, threats, rewards, and observed demonstrations had no effect on the helpless Group 3 dogs. Later experiments have served to confirm the depressive effect on feeling a lack of control over an adverse stimulus. For example, in one experiment, humans performed mental tasks in the presence of distracting noise. Those that could use a switch to turn off the noise rarely bothered to do so, yet they performed better than those that could not turn off the noise. Simply being aware of this option was enough to substantially counteract the noise effect." Unquote. Expanding upon this a bit, it was also found that people's explanatory style had a pretty significant effect on if they were to suffer from learned helplessness or not. Explanatory style is a psychological attribute that indicates how people explain to themselves why they experience a particular event, either positive or negative. With an article on the subject noting, quote, people who generally tend to blame themselves for negative events believe that such events will continue indefinitely and let such events affect many aspects of their lives, display what is called a pessimistic explanatory style. Conversely, people who generally tend to blame outside forces for negative events believe that such events will end soon and do not let such events affect too many aspects of their lives display what is called an optimistic explanatory style." Unquote. And from this perspective, someone with a pessimistic explanatory style tends to see negative events as permanent. Uh, it will never change. It's my fault. I can't do anything correctly. And are likely to suffer from learned helplessness and depression. You could apply this same principle to quite a lot of things, be it someone working a dead-end job, someone with a lot of debt, etc. feeling like there are just too many things outside of their control, which brings them down as a whole. But this can go even farther beyond just experiments and like though, or even how someone perceives the world. Because learned helplessness from the perspective of a tool would potentially be extremely dangerous. In an extreme situation, this would be a powerful tool in torture methods, with the CIA interrogation manual specifically pointing this out as, quote, apathy, which may result from prolonged use of coercive techniques which result in a debility dependency dread state in the subject. If the debility dependency dread state is unduly prolonged, however, the arrestee can sink into a defensive apathy from which it is hard to arouse him." Unquote. This could also easily apply towards general investigations and the like if you've ever watched those interrogation room videos. However, even more broadly, this can also apply towards things like political races. Say, for example, you try voting new people in your state or country or whatever, but it seems like no matter what you do or who you vote for, the same people or person stays in office, or better yet, nothing ever really seems to change anyway, and you're always left disappointed. Well then this too can lead to a learned helplessness, and lead to more people simply not voting at all because you don't feel like it's going to matter in the end anyway. Such things can also make one feel like a small cog in a much bigger machine and ultimately helpless, thus perhaps feeling better to simply not engage with it at all. It's all pretty fucked. Everywhere at the end of time. Now of all the entries on here, I feel like this really made the rounds a year or two back by now here on YouTube. So many of you may already be somewhat aware of this, but for those who aren't, quote, 
Everywhere at the End of Time is the 11th recording by The Caretaker, an alias of English electronic musician Leyland Kirby, released between 2016 and 2019. Its six studio albums use degrading loops of sampled ballroom music to portray the progression of Alzheimer's disease." Unquote. Now to truly understand what Kirby was trying to capture here with this album, perhaps it's best to bring up what exactly Alzheimer's disease is and how it affects the mind and body. According to his own Wikipedia article, quote, Alzheimer's disease is a neurodegenerative disease that usually starts slowly and progressively worsens and is the cause of 60 to 70 percent of cases of dementia. The most common early symptom is difficulty in remembering recent events. As the disease advances, symptoms can involve problems with language, disorientation, including easily getting lost, mood swings, loss of motivation, self-neglect, and behavioral issues. As a person's condition declines, they often withdraw from family and society. Gradually, bodily functions are lost, ultimately leading to death. Although the speed of progression can vary, the average life expectancy following diagnosis is 3 to 12 years." Unquote. It is a slow and eventual decline of one's mind and sense of place in the world and reality in some sense. You forget what you were just about to do. You start to lose important memories that you cherished in your mind that you thought you'd never forget. You start to forget your own friends, family, and everything important to you until you've eventually lost your own sense of self. To die truly and utterly alone, even if you're surrounded by the ones you love, because to you, they are all just strangers. It's a horrifying reality that many have had to face. It's truly one of the most terrible fates I personally can imagine. And what's worse is there is currently no cure for it. Quote, no treatments can stop or reverse its progression, though some may temporarily improve symptoms. A healthy diet, physical activity, and social engagement are generally beneficial in aging, and may help in reducing the risk of cognitive decline and Alzheimer's. Affected people become increasingly reliant on others for assistance, often placing a burden on caregivers. As of 2020, there are approximately 50 million people worldwide with Alzheimer's disease. It most often begins in people over 65 years of age, although up to 10% of cases are early onset impacting those in their 30s and mid 60s. It affects about 6% of people 65 years and older, and women more often than men. It is ranked as the seventh leading cause of death worldwide." Unquote. Bearing that all in mind, everywhere at the end of time, quote, comprises six hours of music, portraying a range of emotions and characterized by noise throughout. Although the first three stages are similar to an empty bliss, the last three depart from Kirby's earlier ambient works. The albums reflect the patient's disorder and death their feelings in the phenomenon of terminal lucidity. In other words, the collection of albums through music and sound emulates the feeling of slowly losing everything that Alzheimer's disease takes from you, before then ending on the phenomenon of terminal lucidity, which is, as noted in a different article, quote, terminal lucidity, also known as rallying, terminal rally, the rally, end of life experience, energy surge, the surge, or pre-mortem surge, is an unexpected return of consciousness, mental clarity, or memory shortly before death in individuals with severe psychiatric or neurological disorders. It has been reported by physicians since the 19th century. Terminal lucidity is a narrower term than the phenomenon Paradoxically, lucidity, where a return to mental clarity can occur any time, not just before death. However, as of 2024, terminal lucidity is not considered a medical term and there is no official consensus on the identifying characteristics. Terminal lucidity is a poorly understood phenomenon in the context of medical and psychological research, and there is no consensus on what the underlying mechanisms are. Its existence challenges the irreversibility paradigm of chronic degenerative dementias. Terminal lucidity is commonly characterized by a potential reduction in the severity of the individual's physical symptoms. For example, of those who were previously nonverbal or may have limited communication abilities may regain their ability to speak. Additionally, 
There may be an increase in cheerfulness or renewed interest in eating and drinking. People with memory problems such as Alzheimer's disease or dementia may experience sudden recollection and recognition of people they had previously lost the ability to identify. During terminal lucidity, cognitive and memory abilities function differently than those of unaffected individuals." Unquote. Terminal lucidity is sort of a mystery all of its own, and exactly how it works and beyond it being something that many have seen happen, no one knows why it does or how it's even possible. At any rate, Everywhere at the end of time, beyond that, is one of those collections of albums, of music, that you just gotta sit down and listen to to really get the full effect of it. Many have noted feeling extremely emotional after having listened to it all in full. Demon Core Quote, The Demon Core was a sphere of plutonium that was involved in two fatal radiation accidents when scientists tested it as a fissile core of an early atomic bomb. It was manufactured by the Manhattan Project, the U.S. nuclear weapon development effort during World War II. It was a subcritical mass that weighed 6.2 kilograms or 14 pounds and was 8.9 centimeters or 3.5 inches in diameter. The core was prepared for shipment to the Pacific Theater as part of the third nuclear weapon to be dropped on Japan. But when Japan surrendered, the core was retained for testing and potential later use in the case of another conflict. The two critical accidents occurred in Los Alamos Laboratory in New Mexico on August 21st, 1945 and on May 21st, 1946. In both cases, an experiment was intended to demonstrate how close the core was to criticality. With a tamper, layer of dense material surrounding the fissile material, but the core was accidentally put into a critical configuration. Physicist Harry Dallahan in the first incident and Louis Sloton in the second suffered acute radiation syndrome or ARS and died soon afterward. While others present in the laboratory were also exposed, the core was melted down during the summer of 1946 and the material was recycled to use in other cores. Unquote. Going into a little more detail regarding those two incidents, quote, On August 21st, 1945, the plutonium core produced a burst of neuron radiation that resulted in physicist Harry Dallahan's death. Dallahan made a mistake while performing neuron reflector experiments on the core, who was working alone. A security guard, Private Robert J. Hemmerly, was seated at a desk 10 to 12 feet away. The core was placed within a stack of neuron reflective tungsten carbine bricks, and the addition of each brick made the assembly closer to criticality. While the attempting to stack another brick around the assembly, Dallahan accidentally dropped it onto the core and thereby caused the core to go well into supercriticality, a self-sustaining critical chain reaction. He quickly moved the brick off the assembly, but received a fatal dose of radiation. He died 25 days later from acute radiation poisoning." Unquote. It should also be noted that Dallahan was only 24 years old when he passed. Now, in regards to the second incident, well, quote, on May 21st, 1946, physicist Louis Sloton and seven other personnel were in a Los Alamos laboratory conducting another experiment to verify the closeness of the core to criticality by the positioning of neuron reflectors. Slaughton, who was leaving Los Alamos, was showing the technique to Alvin C. Graves, who would use it in a final test before the Operation Crossroads nuclear test scheduled a month later in Bikini Atoll. It required the operator to place two half spheres of beryllium, a neuron reflector, around the core to be tested and manually lowered the top reflector over the core using a thumb hole at the polar point. As the reflectors were manually moved closer and farther away from each other, neuron detectors indicated the core's neuron multiplication rate. The experimenter needed to maintain a slight separation between the reflector halves to allow enough neurons to escape from the core in order to stay below criticality. The standard protocol was to use shims between the halves, as allowing them to close completely could result in an instantaneous formation of a critical mass and a lethal power excursion. By Sloton's own unapproved protocol, the shims were not used. The top half of the reflector was resting directly on the bottom half at one point, 
While 180 degrees from this point, a gap was maintained by the blade of a flat-tipped screwdriver in Sloan's hand. The size of the gap between the reflectors was changed by twisting the screwdriver. Sloan, who was given to bravado, became the local expert, performing the test on almost a dozen occasions, often in his trademark blue jeans and cowboy boots, in front of a room full of observers. Enrico Fermi reportedly told Sloan and others they would be dead within a year if they continued performing the test in that matter. Scientists referred to this flirting with the possibility of a nuclear chain reaction as tickling the dragon's tail, based on a remark by physicist Richard Feynman, who compared the experiments to tickling the tail of a sleeping dragon. On the day of the incident, Slaughton's screwdriver slipped outward a fraction of an inch while he was lowering the top reflector, allowing the refractor to fall into place around the core. Instantly, there was a flash of light. The core had become supercritical, releasing an intense burst of neuron radiation the exposer of which was calculated based on the estimated half second between when the sphere closed and when Slotin removed the top reflector. Slotin quickly twisted his wrist, flipping the top shell to the floor. The position of Slotin's body over the apparatus also shielded the others from much of the neuron radiation, but he received a lethal dose of 1000 rad or 10 GY. Neuron and 114 rad or 1.14 GI gamma radiation in less than a second and died nine days later from acute radiation poisoning." Unquote. He was 35 when he died. While while it seems as though everyone else in the room was at the very least spared this painful death, which according to his own wiki page is described as, quote, despite intensive medical care and offers from numerous volunteers to donate blood for transfusions, Slaughton's condition was incurable. He called his parents and they were flown at Army's expense from Winnipeg to be with him. They arrived on the fourth day after the incident and by the fifth day his condition started to deteriorate rapidly. Over the next four days, Slaughton suffered an agonizing sequence of radiation-induced traumas, including severe diarrhea, reduced urine output, swollen hands, erythema, massive blisters on his hands and forearms, intestinal paralysis and gangrene. He had internal radiation burns throughout his body, which one medical experiment described as three-dimensional sunburn. By the seventh day, he was experiencing periods of mental confusion. His lips turned blue, and he was put in an oxygen tent. He ultimately experienced a total disintegration of bodily functions and slipped into a coma. Slaughton died at 11 a.m. on the 30th of May in the presence of his parents and was buried in the Charlie Zadek Cemetery in Winnipeg on the 2nd of June, 1946." Unquote. So yeah, pretty gnarly shit. And as known before, the demon core was then melted down in the summer of 1946 and recycled for the use of other cores. Homicidal sleepwalking. This entry is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. Cases of people killing people in their sleep, or at the very least, using that as a defense for them having just killed someone. And this has happened enough that there is actually a legal precedent to this in the court of law. And in a larger article on sleepwalking in general, it is noted on this subject of homicidal sleepwalking, quote, as sleepwalking behaviors occur without volition, sleepwalking can be used as a legal defense as a form of legal automatism. Note that automatism is, quote, in criminal law, automatism is a rarely used criminal defense. It is one of the mental condition defenses that relate to the mental state of the defendant. Automatism can be seen variously as a lack of voluntariness, lack of culpability, unconsciousness, or excuse. Automatism means that the defendant was not aware of his or her actions when making the particular movements that constituted the illegal act." Unquote. Now, as far as some legal case examples go, we have a few examples. Starting with, quote, 1846, Albert Terrell used sleepwalking as a defense against charges of murdering Maria Bickford, a prostitute living in a Boston brothel, which might I add, ended up 
being successful for him, with him pretty much getting away with murder. Then there's 1961, Sergeant Willis Boschiers confessed to strangling a local woman named Jean Constable in the early hours on New Year's Day 1961, but claimed that he was asleep and only woke to realize what he had done. He pled not guilty on the basis of being asleep at the time he committed the offense, and was acquitted. Or, in 1981, Steven Steinberg of Scottsdale, Arizona was accused of killing his wife and acquitted on the grounds of temporary insanity. Or how about 1992, R.V. Parks. Parks was accused of killing his mother-in-law and attempting to kill his father-in-law. He was, again, acquitted by the Supreme Court of Canada. Pretty wild shit. But on the other hand, it doesn't always work out for our sleepwalking folks, like that of 1999 Arizona v. Folleter. Scott Folleter of Phoenix, Arizona was accused of killing his wife. The court concluded that the murder was too complex to be committed while sleepwalking. Falter was committed of first-degree murder and sentenced to life with no possibility of parole. Or 2001 California v. Reitz. Stephen Reitz killed his lover, Ava Weinfurtner. He told police he had no recollection of the attack, but he had flashbacks of believing he was in a scuffle with a male intruder. His parents testified in court that he had been a sleepwalker from childhood. The court convicted Reitz of first-degree murder in 2004, however. But then again, in 2001, Antonio Nieto murdered his wife and mother-in-law and attempted to murder his daughter and son before being disarmed. Nieto claimed to have been asleep during the attack and dreaming that he was defending himself against aggressive ostriches. However, his children stated that he had recognized them and had told his son to not turn on the lights because their mother, gravely injured already, was sleeping. In 2007, Nieto was sentenced to 10 years internment in a psychiatric hospital and ordered to pay 171,000 euros as compensation to the victims. Belmaz Faces Quote, The Belmaz Faces, or the Faces of Belmaz, is an alleged paranormal phenomenon in a private house in Spain. The phenomenon started in 1971 when residents claimed images of faces appeared in a concrete floor of the house. Located in the Pereira family home of Calais Real 5, Belmez de la Moralenda, Jean Andalusia, Spain. I probably just messed that all up, but whatever. The Belmez family have been responsible for bringing large numbers of sightseers to Belmez. Various faces have supposedly appeared and disappeared at irregular intervals since 1971, and have been frequently photographed by the local newspaper and curious visitors. Many Belmez residents believe that the faces were not made by a human hand. Some paranormal investigators believe that it is a photographic phenomenon, subconsciously produced by the deceased former owner of the home, Maria Gomez Camara. Skeptical researchers have performed extensive of tests on the faces and believe that they are fabrications possibly created as part of a hoax. It is suspected that the Herria family may have perpetuated the hoax for financial gain." Unquote. So yeah, sort of your standard paranormal thing. If a family claiming something weird going on, people are into paranormal stuff, sort of attaching theories and ideas to these concepts, and skeptics sure that the whole thing is just fake. However, something that caught my eye while reading this article is the term thought of graphic or photography, which in its own Wikipedia article quotes is photography, also called thermography, psychic photography, and ningraphy, and ninja is the claimed ability to burn images from one's mind onto surfaces, such as photographic film by parapsychic means. While the term photography has been in the English lexicon since 1913, the more recent term, projected thermography, is a, is a neologism popularized in 2002 American film The Ring, a remake of the 1998 Japanese horror film Ringu, unquote. Which is pretty interesting, but yeah, that's pretty much it. Overton Bridge. So a few of you might already be aware of this one, but in short, this is the Doggo Death Zone. Quote, during the 1950s, locals started referring to the bridge as the Bridge of Death 
or the Dog Seasu Bridge, as it was reported the dogs were leaping from the bridge into the ravine below. The story gained more prominence during the late 2000s and early 2010s. In 2004, Kenneth Michael was walking with his family and Golden Retriever when the dog suddenly bolted and jumped off the bridge. It survived, but was traumatized by the experience. Going into 2005, at least five other dogs also jumped over the course of six months. In 2014, Alice Trevoro, who was walking with her Springer Spaniel named Cassie, reported a strange experience on Overton Bridge. I had parked up, and as she is so obedient, I didn't put her lead on. Me and my son walked towards Cassie, who was staring at something above the bridge. She definitely saw something that made her jump. There is something sinister going on. It was so out of character for her. In 2019, Bob and Melissa Hill, the owners of Overton House, said that in 17 years of residing at the house, they had witnessed a number of dogs become agitated and fall from the bridge. Bob Hill stated that the scent of mink, pine martens, and other animals agitated the dogs, resulting in their jump onto the bridge wall. The dogs catch the scent of mink, pine martens, or some other mammal, and they then will jump up on the wall of the bridge, and because it's tapered, they will just topple over. Hill, who was originally a pastor from Texas, also stated he believed the grounds around the house possessed some sort of spiritual quality, unquote. So yeah, it is highly advised you don't take your furry buds to this bridge regardless of the reason they keep jumping off is. Though the paranormal here goes a bit beyond just dogs ending it all, or attempting to end it all anyway. With quote, in October 1994, paranoid schizophrenic Kevin Moy threw his two-week-year-old son Owen to his death from the bridge because he believed that his son was an incarnation of the devil due to a birthmark. He said he chose the location due to his association with dark spirits going back to the druid days. Following the kill, Moy attempted to commit but he was caught and placed in a mental hospital. Some local people think there is a supernatural activity around the bridge and Overton House, which could be luring dogs to their death because animals are sensitive to the paranormal, unquote. So yeah, it's a pretty fucking cursed bridge, regardless if there's anything truly paranormal or not. Dancing Plague of 1518. Quote, the Dancing Plague of 1518, or Dance Epidemic of 1518, was a case of dancing mania that occurred in Strasbourg, Alsace, or modern-day France, in the Holy Roman Empire from July 1518 to September of 1518. Somewhere between 50 and 400 people took to dancing for weeks. There were many theories behind this phenomenon, the most popular being stress-induced mass hysteria suggested by John Waller. Other theories include ergo and religious explanations. And there is controversy concerning the number of deaths. Unquote. And yeah, that's basically it. There's no actual answer as to why this happened. Though again, it seems like the most likely case is mass hysteria. Still, it's pretty fucking wild for a bunch of people to just start dancing and seemingly not being able to stop until they drop dead. In other bits of trivia regarding this crazy event, the 202 short film by the name of Strasbourg 1518 was inspired by it, and it was also the inspiration behind the 2022 choral song Choria Mania by Florence and the Machine. It was the third track on the album Dance Fever, which took its title from the song. So, that's pretty cool. Skinwalker Ranch. Quote, Skinwalker Ranch, also known as Sherman Ranch, is a property of approximately 512 acres, located southeast of Bullard, Utah. It is reputed to be the site of paranormal and UFO-related activities. Its name is taken from the Skinwalker of the Navajo legend concerning vengeful shamans, unquote. Now, for those unaware what exactly a Skinwalker is, quote, in Navajo culture, a Skinwalker is a type of harmful witch who has the ability to turn into, possess, or disguise themselves as an animal." Unquote. The main article on Skinwalker Ranch, however, notes that there have been sightings of UFOs, strange markings on the grass, mutilated cattle, creatures with piercing red eyes that are impervious to bullets, and uh, 
basically it being a battleground for the aliens and the skinwalkers to have a big battle royale and get that sweet Fortnite dub. But yeah, uh, the ranch's legends have gone on for a very long time, and several films and TV shows slash specials have been made documenting and discussing its supposed paranormal nature in further detail. Elephant's Foot Quote, the elephant's foot is the nickname given to a large mass of corium and other materials formed underneath the Chernobyl nuclear power plant near Pripyat, Ukraine, during the Chernobyl disaster of April 1986, notable for its extreme radioactivity. It is named for its ringly appearance, evocative of the foot of an elephant. Discovered in December of the year of the disaster, it is located in a maintenance corridor below the remains of reactor number four, though the visible elephant's foot is only a part of a larger mass. It is still an extremely radioactive of object, though the danger has decreased over time due to the decay of its radioactive components. However, at the time of its discovery, about eight months after formation, radioactivity near the elephant's foot was approximately 8,000 to 10,000 rotgens, or 80 to 100 grays per hour, delivering a 50-50 lethal dose of radiation within five minutes." Unquote. I would go into more details surrounding Chernobyl and the whole disaster but there really is a lot to it and it's a bit too much to go over in this iceberg at the moment. But needless to say, many films and video games and the like have been inspired off of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant accident, its legacy continuing on into this very day. Miracle Village Quote, Miracle Village, officially City of Refuge since 2014, is a community on Muck City Road, about three miles east of Pahokee, Florida, that serves as a haven for registered sex offenders. It is located within one of the most isolated and poorest parts of Palm Beach County. The site was chosen because of its isolation, given that the sex offender residence restrictions do not apply. Description of this place is noted as, quote, a complex of 54 duplexes and six family homes is operated by Matthew 25 Ministries, an organization with the stated goal of providing prison aftercare. The executive director in 2017 was Ted Rodrum, himself an ex-offender. In October of 2010, the community included 66 sex offenders. In July 2013, there was 100, and by 2017, it held 120. Total population as of 2018, including family members, was 200. It is the largest community of registered sex offenders in the United States. There are an additional 300 who have resided there but have since moved on. Unquote. So, uh, yeah. No, uh, no comment, I suppose. Bonus Entry Thioacetone. Also known as the Brap of Terror, Thioacetone is, quote, Thioacetone is an organ sulfur compound belonging to the thione group called thioketones, which is a chemical formula. It is an unstable orange or brown substance that can be isolated only at low temperatures, above negative 20 Celsius or negative 4 degrees Fahrenheit. Thiacetone readily converts to a polymer and a trimmer, trithiacetone. It has an extremely potent, unpleasant odor and is considered one of the worst smelling chemicals known to humanity. Now, you're probably wondering with such a wild description, <laughs> one of the worst smells known to humanity. By God, what the fuck does that smell like? That is a very dramatic use of language. And, well, for good reason. As the article goes on to describe the odor and the effects it has on people. Quote, Thiacetone has an extremely foul odor. Like many low molecular weight organ sulfur compounds, the smell is potent and can be detected even when highly diluted. In 1889, an attempt to distill the chemical in the German city of Freiburg was followed by cases of vomiting, nausea, and unconsciousness in the area within a radius of 0.75 kilometers, or 0.47 miles, around the laboratory due to the smell. In an 1890 report, British chemists at the Whitehall Soap Works in Leeds noted that dilution seemed to make the smell worse and described the smell as fearful. 
In 1967, ESSA researchers repeated the experiment of cracking trithiacetone at a laboratory south of Oxford, UK. They reported their experience as follows. Recently, we found ourselves with an odor problem beyond our worst expectations. During early experiments, a stopper jumped from a bottle of residues and, although replaced at once, resulted in an immediate complaint of nausea and sickness from colleagues working in a building 200 yards away. Two of our chemists, who had done no more than investigate the cracking of minute amounts of trithiacetone, found themselves the object of hostile stares in a restaurant and suffered the humiliation of having a waitress spray the area around them with deodorant. The odors defied the expected effects of dilution since workers in the laboratory did not find the odors intolerable and genuinely denied responsibility since they were working in closed systems. To convince them otherwise, they were dispersed with other observers around the laboratory at distances up to a quarter of a mile and one drop of either acetone, gym diethyl, or the mother liquors from crude trithiacetone crystallizations were placed on a watch glass in a fume cupboard. The odor was detected downwind in seconds." Unquote. By God, imagine the smell! And um, speaking of smells, Jenkum. So this one is made the rounds again, mainly because of a video covering the topic by Justin Wang. But the article notes, quote, Jenkum is a purported inhalant and hallucinogen created by fermented human waste. In the mid 1990s, it was reported to be a popular street drug among Zombian youth created by placing feces and urine in a jar or a bucket, sealing it with a balloon or lid respectively, and leaving it to ferment in the sun. Afterwards, they would inhale the fumes created. In November 2007, there was a moral panic in the United States after widespread reports of Jenkum becoming a popular recreational drug in middle and high schools across the country, though the true extent of the practice has since been called into question. Several sources reported that the increase in American media coverage was based on a hoax and unfaulty internet research." Unquote. The article then goes on to describe the effects it has on those that have used it, stating, quote, The effects of Jenkum inhalation supposedly last for around an hour and consist of auditory and visual hallucinations for some users. In 1995, one user told a reporter, It is more pleasant than cannabis. And a 1999 report interviewed a user who said, With glue, I just hear voices in my head. But with Jenkum, I see visions. I see my mother mother who is dead, and I forget about the problems in my life." Unquote. Yes indeed, and you too can forget all the problems of your life if you just inhale the sweet, sweet smell of your own piss and shit. But uh, you know, probably don't do that. Anora Petrova. So this entry is actually a creepy pasta about a supposed Wikipedia page. Yep. Even after the 17 hour creepypasta iceberg, we are still far from done with them. So with that in mind, let's give it a read then, shall we? Debris, Ice Cube, and Redacted.com. Subject, Brie, please read read this. Bree, don't delete this. I know you hate me, but we were best friends once and I need you to read this. I think I'm in serious trouble and there's nothing you can do, but I need you to read this so that you can understand. I know we haven't talked since sectionals. It's been forever, but what happened to you wasn't my fault. At least, it wasn't entirely my fault. I know everyone thinks it was, but I would never do anything to hurt you. This is going to sound crazy, but I need to tell you so that someone knows. It started when I was in 8th grade. It was the night before the Crystal Classic competition. I was at home and couldn't sleep because I was so nervous about competing. Well, I got on my computer just sort of surfing the web and stuff, but I couldn't concentrate on anything. I was just sitting there, so I googled myself. I never should have done that, Brie. At first, it was just the usual stuff you find when you google yourself. Then I found a link to a Wikipedia page about me. I thought our club or my dad made it or something. There wasn't much there, just some basic facts about skating and what city I lived in. But the thing that got me was that I said I had won that year's Crystal Classic. I laughed. I thought for sure someone had only made it to encourage me. I confronted my dad about it and 
but he denied it. When I won the competition the next day, I was so happy. That was the first competition I had ever won and it felt so good. Remember how hard I worked after that? That was when my parents hired Sergei to coach me. You know how much that must have cost? After that, I would check the page before every competition. It would always say where I placed. It said that I would win the regionals of 15, and that came true. Afterwards, Sergei convinced my mom and dad that I had a real shot at the Olympics. That was when they pulled me from school. I skated every day, but I just wasn't progressing the way Sergei said I needed to if I wanted a shot at the championship. I was working so hard and skating well, but still Sergei said it wasn't good enough. When the sectionals came, all I could think about was winning, so I did something I shouldn't have. Everyone was saying that you were the favorite, and I felt like I already lost the competition. So I made a Wikipedia account and tried to update my page to say that I was the winner. The thing is, is that after I tried to update the page, I checked it, and all it said was, Anora Petrova is a selfish little bitch who's going to get what she deserves. I broke down. That's why I looked so awful the next day. I was in a daze. I remember watching your routine and seeing your blade snap. The next thing I knew, I was on the ground and my face was covered in blood from where the tip blew off and sliced my forehead. Then they told me it was my fault because I had your skates in my possession earlier. Bree, I honestly didn't do anything to your skates. I wanted to win, but I wouldn't do anything to hurt you. When they told me I was banned from any further competitions, everyone said I got what I deserved. Nobody even asked for my side of the story. I guess you heard that Sergei dropped me after that too. He said that I had ruined him. No one could talk to me. Do you know what it's like to be ostracized by everyone? I couldn't even get ice time. And then the page got worse. Anytime I check it, it would say all these horrible things about me. I can't even tell you half of them. The language was so vile. I'd cry every time I read it, but I couldn't stop checking it. I knew I had to do something. So I made a complaint to Wikipedia. I even tried calling them but no one there claimed to know anything about the page. I was at home alone that Friday night when I decided to check to see if it had been taken down. The page was still there, only this time it said, Honora Petrova is a pathetic little orphan. I freaked. I kept calling my parents to warn them, but every time I did, all I would hear was this horrible laughter on the other end. I, I must have called them a hundred times until I couldn't take the sound of the laughing anymore. After the accident, the police gave me their phones and there wasn't any record of my calls that night. I was devastated. Before that, I was so busy training all day and doing homeschool, I never realized just how alone I had been the whole time. I know you tried to read out but I was so depressed and angry that I just shut everything out. Once I turned 18 and got the settlement money from the court, I came to Switzerland. I got to reinvent myself. My skating really took off. It hasn't even been a year and I still feel like everything that happened was so long ago. That's why I shouldn't have done it, Bree. I'm writing you now from my old hotel outside of Prague. I'm auditioning for the ice circus tomorrow. I know it's the kind of thing we used to make fun of, but I really want this. I was feeling really nervous, so out of old habit I checked my page. It's so hard to say this, but when I read it, see if I'd get the job tomorrow, all it said was, Anora Petrova died friendless and alone, and it was today's date listed as the date of death. I'm sobbing so hard I can barely type this, but I wanted you to know the truth. Please believe me, Bree. I attached a screenshot of the page, it's all there, just as I told you. I don't know what to do. I don't know anyone here and nobody speaks English. I keep refreshing the page. God, it's been forever. I keep refreshing it, but it still hasn't changed. I'm waiting for midnight. I don't know what to do. So I lock myself in my room. It's only a few minutes to midnight now. All I can do is refresh the page. I'm exhausted, but I can't stop. I'm afraid to leave the computer until... Until I know what happens next. Unquote. So yeah, and that's the story of Anora Petrova, and actually it's a pretty decent creepypasta. Very unique premise of a Wikipedia page. Something I like about it is that it's never actually explained why the Wikipedia article exists. Like, it seems to be paranormal by all standards of the story, but at the same time, you could make the argument that it was made by some kind of stalker. Or maybe the Wikipedia article is almost like a strange manifestation, an entity in of itself. 
Regardless, it's pretty good. Tyke. Quote, Tyke was a female African bush elephant from Mozambique who performed with Circus International of Honolulu, Hawaii. On August 20th, 1994, during a performance at the Neil Blaisdell Center, she killed her trainer, Alan Campbell, and seriously injured her groomer, Dallas Beckwith. Tyke then ran from the arena and through the streets of the Kakakato Central Business District for more than 30 minutes. Unable to calm the elephant, local police officers opened fire on the animal, which collapsed from the wounds and died. While the majority attack in the arena was recorded on consumer videotape by several spectators, additional professional video footage captured the attack on local publicist Steve Hirano and the shooting of Tyke herself, both of which took place outside of the building. A nearby police officer seeing the attack fired multiple shots in the direction of the elephant, distracting her and causing her to flee away from Hirano. After a half an hour of chasing Tyke down, local police officers fired 86 shots into the 8,000 pound elephant. Tyke finally collapsed from the numerous wounds and died. Following the Hawaii accident, Tyke became a symbol of circus tragedies and of animal rights. In the aftermath, lawsuits were filed against the city of Honolulu and the state of Hawaii, the circus and Tyke's owner, John Kuno Jr. and his Hawthorne Corp. Honolulu lawyer, William Fenton Sink, sued Kuno on behalf of numerous plaintiffs, including young children who suffered psychological trauma after witnessing Tyke's killing. While the lawsuits were settled out of court, the details of the monetary decision were kept sealed from publication. In honor of Sink's work in the Tyke case, Animal Rights Hawaii renamed its Order of the Innocent Award to the William Fenton Sink Award for Defense of Animals." Unquote. There are then links in the Wikipedia article to videos of the graphic attack and Tyke's death, but I will spare you from seeing that in this video. But needless to say, it is a terribly tragic and brutal event all around. Broadcast Signal Intrusion Some of you guys may be familiar with this concept of how many creepypastas and just actual real world cases of this happening have gone viral and been talked about by a fair few YouTubers at this point. But nonetheless, quote, a broadcast signal intrusion is the hijacking of broadcast signals of radio, television stations, cable television broadcast feeds, or satellite signals without permission or license. Hijacking incidents have involved local TV and radio stations, as well as cable and national networks. Although television, cable, and satellite broadcast signal intrusions tend to receive more media coverage, radio station intrusions are more frequent as many simply rebroadcast a signal received from another radio station. All that is required is an FM transmitter that can overpower the same frequency as the station being rebroadcast, limited by the inverse square law. Other methods that have been used in North America to intrude on legal broadcasts include using a directional antenna to overpower the uplink frequency of a broadcast relay station, breaking into the transmitter area and splicing audio directly into the feed, and cyber attacks on internet connected broadcasting equipment. As a cable television operator connects itself to the signal path between individual stations and the system subscribers, broadcasters have fallen victim to signal tampering on cable systems on multiple occasions." Unquote. So yeah, but ask for some notable examples of this. Well, there are quite a few, with probably the most famous of them at this point being the Max Headroom incidents, which the article notes, quote, On the night of November 22nd, 1987, an unidentified man wearing a Max Headroom mask appeared on the signal of two television stations in Chicago, Illinois. WGN-TV, owned by Tribune Broadcasting, was hijacked first. The intrusion occurred during the sports report on its 9 p.m newscast and lasted about 25 seconds. Next came PBS affiliate WTTW, where the man was seen and heard uttering garbled remarks before dropping his pants, partially exposing his ass, and was then spanked by a fly swatter by a woman wearing a French-made costume before normal programming resumed. 
The second interception occurred at about 11 p.m. during an episode of the Doctor Who serial, Horror of Fang Rock, and lasted almost 90 seconds. None of the individuals responsible for the intrusion have been identified. This incident got the attention of the CBS Evening News the next day, and was talked about nationwide. The HBO incident was also mentioned in the same news report." Unquote. And here's some footage of said incident. Then we have the Captain Midnight Intrusion, which reads as, quote, At 12.32 a.m. Eastern Time on April 27th, 1986, HBO had its satellite signal feed from its operations center on Long Island in Hophog, New York, interrupted by a man calling himself Captain Midnight. The interruption occurred during a presentation of the Falcon and the Snowman. The intrusion lasted between four and five minutes and was seen by viewers along the East Coast. The man, who during the interruption also threatened to hijack the signals of Showtime and the movie channel, was later caught and identified as John R. McDougall of Oakla, Florida. He was prosecuted shortly thereafter. Authorities were tipped off by a man from Wisconsin in a phone booth at the rest area of Interstate 75 in Gainesville, Florida. The man filing the report said that he overheard McDougal bragging about the incident. McDougal was able to perform the intrusion while working a second job as a master control operator at a satellite teleport in Florida, where he worked to make ends meet due to declining income from his satellite TV equipment business. He stated that he did it because he was frustrated with HBO's service rates and that it was hurting his business selling satellite dishes. The message placed over the SMPT color bars broadcast by McDougal read, Good evening, HBO. From Captain Midnight, $12.95 a month? No way. Showtime slash movie channel beware. Unquote. Then there is the Playboy Channel religious message incident, which the story of goes as follows. Quote, a broadcast of the movie Three Daughters on the Playboy Channel was disrupted with a text-only religious message on Sunday, September 6th of 1987. The message read, Thus saith the Lord thy God, remember the Sabbath, and keep it holy. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. From the Bible verses Exodus 28 and Matthew 417. Thomas Haney, an employee of the Christian Broadcasting Network, was convicted of satellite piracy in connection with the incident. Haney, who pleaded his innocence, was the first person convicted under the new federal law, which had made satellite hacking a felony following the Captain Midnight incident. Unquote. Apartments. I'm at the best of it, but uh, we're going to be looking for a bigger place. I know that uh, she wants to. Then we have some sort of interesting lore regarding these sorts of intrusions in the 70s and 80s Soviet Russia, with the article noting, quote, The broadcast signal intrusion was a common practice in the Soviet Union during the 70s and 80s due to the absence of and high demand for any non-government broadcasting. As early as 1966, there was a report of an incident in the city of Kaluga, where an 18-year-old had broadcast a hoax announcement that nuclear war had broken out with the United States. In the mid-70s, so many pirates were operating around the city of Arkhangelsk, especially at night, that local people were urged to telephone reports of violators to the special number. Hijackers using call signs such as Cucumber, 
Radio Millimeter, Green Goat, Fortune, and others would overpower the signals on relay stations for wired radio networks to transmit their programming, or transmit into wired radio networks during gaps in regular programming, even though the incidents appear to have been fairly common according to reports of the BBC, most were not publicly acknowledged for policy reasons. Reports in newspapers typically refer to the hijackers as radio hooligans, broadcasting drivel, rudeness, vulgarity, uncensored expressions, and trashy music. State news organizations also spread propaganda against such pirate broadcasters, claiming that they had interfered with the state frequency used by Aeroflot, preventing a doctor in an air ambulance from transmitting information about a patient, unquote, which is extremely based. Using technology against the totalitarian government? Uh, I think so. Some more but maybe slightly lesser known incidents of this stuff occurring include a satellite feed intrusion where, quote, on September 7th, 2012, the Disney Junior block on the Disney Channel was interrupted on the Dish Network, replacing six minutes of Lilo and Stitch with a portion of a hardcore pornographic movie, unquote. Then there was a radio signal intrusion in which, quote, in April 2016, multiple radio stations in the United States were hacked in order to broadcast an explicit podcast about the furry fandom. The hackers targeted individual Barrick's audio streaming devices that were findable on the search engine Shodan, logged into them, and locked out the owners while airing the podcast. So, uh, yeah, pretty funny cursed shit. The Forbidden Wiki. So, for this last entry this tier, we have yet another creepypasta from the No Sleep subreddit, no less. Now, I would read this one in full like the last one, but it is a fair bit longer, and we'd probably tack on another 20 to 25 minutes for just one entry on this iceberg. So instead, I will just quickly run through some of the stuff with it. To start, the whole thing is basically about Wikipedia and how people enjoy and use Wikipedia all the time for gaining information, that sort of thing. However, what is then described is a ritual one can do on the website of Wikipedia to access the Forbidden Wiki part of the website. Now, if you're not familiar, a ritual pasta is basically a set of instructions which you have to follow to a T, and usually if you don't follow it or do something that would go against it, you could fall victim to something dangerous or fuck up the whole thing, or maybe your computer will be hacked, whatever, that sort of thing, you know? Um, and so this is basically a ritual pasta about how to get to that Forbidden Wiki. Now, I would go over all the details, but it is, again, rather long on the ritual. So if you want to hear all the details on how to do that, I guess let me know in the comments down below and maybe in the director's cut of this whole Wikipedia iceberg, I'll just read the whole creepypasta. But I think the most interesting part of it is after you do this ritual of sorts, you gain access to the Forbidden Wiki where you can gain all sorts of forbidden knowledge. And the creepypasta then goes on to show several examples of said wiki, which I shall read all of them in full now. Starting with quote, The Great Lakes Incident. The Great Lakes Incident was a naval battle that took place across all five Great Lakes on the Canadian U.S. border from 2007 to 2011. Reports of a mysterious ship rising out of the water alerted Canadian authorities in late 2010. The belligerents were of an unusual nature, able to withstand conventional weaponry, possessing multiple heads, considered in-between amphibian and humanoid, finally resolved using firebombs and chemical weapons. Inhabitants of the Bermuda Triangle, the beings living on these small, scattered islands are extremely hostile towards human contact, reported to be able to fly, causing trouble for aircraft traveling through, believed to have a originated from a large underwater volcano, the Grand Canyon Void. The Grand Canyon Void is a hole in the ground in the northwest Arizona measuring approximately 4.6 meters in diameter. Hikers reported staring into the hole for hours on end before they were dragged away from it by park authorities. An average of 12 hikers were reported to have jumped into it during the month of March, with their bodies turning up in different countries. Mr. Dream. Mr. Dream is an Australian DJ from Perth, 
His self-proclaimed style is known as Infernal Trance. People at his live shows have been reported to experience moments of incredible euphoria before disemboweling each other in the crowd. The manhunt is ongoing, with his latest show reported to have occurred in June of 2019, an underground venue in Paris. The Ackroyd Mansion The Ackroyd Mansion is a large estate located on the outskirts of Houston, Texas, belonging to the Ackroyd family, famously known for being the founding members of the cult known as the Dawn of the Collapsing Moon. 77 attempts have been made to infiltrate the house, resulting in 587 officer casualties. Only one known member of the Ackroyd family has been neutralized. The members are known to conduct rituals involving biological transformations of the human body. These creatures react in accordance with lunar cycles, exhibiting the most violent tendencies when the moon appears early in its first quarter. Channel 51 News Channel 51 News is a controversial news station that broadcasts on Channel 51 between 3 to 4 a.m. The reports presented on the program have been considered nonsensical and disturbing to the viewers watching. Sometimes the hosts have reported incidents that have not occurred up until that point, only for these occasions to transpire one week after. As was the case with the Tokyo Massacre, the location of the channel broadcasts out of remains impossible to pinpoint. As hard as it may be to believe, there are some examples of more normal pages on the wiki. Some of the other ones I've seen are downright fucked. The man inside your head. The man inside your head is an arcane entity that exists within your subconscious. His intentions are malicious and a good portion of your mental capacity is used to suppress him from escaping at any given time. Don't let him escape. Eye in the sky. The eye in the sky is large eye measuring approximately 4,400 meters in diameter that appears in the sky every so often, usually during violent storms. When it appears, it is advised to not look at it under any circumstances. The only exception to this rule is for those who have been forsaken and absolutely need to. You'll know if you need to. The corner of the basement. The corner in your basement is that one dark spot in your basement tucked away in that far corner. No matter how much light you shine on it, it'll never illuminate, and you'll never know what's lurking within it. You better figure it out what it is soon." Unquote. So yeah, it's mostly kind of corny, really basic horror stuff. It's kind of cool from a, oh, look at all these things that exist within the real world, but no one knows about them sort of things, but they are all just way too unrealistic, nonsensical, and silly for it to really make any kind of sense. So, I mean, overall, it's, it's all right. Not the worst creepypasta ever. Um, it does end on one last little story about the author finding a page about a phone number that once you know about will end up calling you and you need to answer it and follow his instructions exactly. And if you refuse, he will come to you. You will only have two chances to answer the phone. And the story ends with him actually getting a phone call and he let it ring without picking it up, noting that because that must be real, he has one last chance to answer the phone. Ending on that note. So yeah, um, decent little creepypasta. Not much else to say than that. It's a bit corny. Yeah. And that is it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all so much for watching through part one of the disturbing Wikipedia iceberg. Expect part two to come out sometime here soon, as well as the Newgrounds iceberg part one coming out very soon as well. And if you happen to have any Wikipedia article suggestions for the next two parts of this iceberg, please be sure to comment down below and let me know about some of the more interesting, disturbing stuff that you are personally aware of. And they just might be included within the iceberg. All that being said, I also want to take this opportunity to thank all of my loyal patrons and channel members. Thank you all so much for continuing to support the channel and myself as I continue on with these projects on almost a weekly basis at this point now. Thank you to all of my night eggs and my night owlets, as well as a very special thank you to all of my great night owls, including Hexmaniac Hannah and Ho Hot, and a very special thank you to all of my arch owls, including the wise Nicodemus, the talented Cherry NGT, the good Chi Vibes Zen Garden Party, the daring Daniel P. Tree, the mysterious Mr. Gaming Sheep, the fearless Forgotten Ace, and the Supersonic Sword. Thank you all, and 
And until next time, this has been Dylan the Night Owl flying off.